Hello and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Samson Folk. You're joining me today in another, I don't know, like there's a bunch of these coming out all at once. So is it weekly? Not really, but I also didn't do it for a couple of weeks. So, you know, it's the catch up podcast, let's say. And the last episode was the consensus version. And this is of the same ilk. Last episode, of course, with Jackson Frank, where we talked about the Raptors and Basically, what this is, is an exploration of what Americans think of the Raptors. And so we have another one of those here today. You can find them on Twitter at M Schindler NBA. That's M Schindler NBA. Pretty easy to put in there. He's on staff at Basketball News. He's freelancing for 1.37 p.m. And he's doing a bunch of podcasts, including uh, Tag the Roll, which is, for my money, one of the better draft scouting podcasts. It's pretty good. Mark, how you doing, man? Hampton, I'm really good. Um, it has been an eventful couple of weeks, months, whatever you want to call it. Um, it. I walked my dog this morning. Uh, this is maybe part of the reason why I do. I, I mean, like I literally said two weeks ago, I normally don't get like my girlfriend Karina came in and uh, I was like, you know, I normally don't get sick during the winter. And then I got COVID like three days later um, and it was 15 degrees outside. And I, I, I guess, you know, this is a Canadian podcast, so I'm trying to remember what 15 degrees Fahrenheit is in, in Celsius, <laughs> but um, you can do the, you can do that on your, on your calculator on your phone. But uh, yeah, it's been very cold. I got very sick, but we're good now. Um, this is the first podcast I've done in like close to three weeks. So um, I'm excited to be on. Getting the voice back in shape. Got to yes. for the 18 podcasts a day that you're typically doing. <laughs> Yes, we're 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 cutting it back a little bit in 2022, making my voice a little bit more uh, suppressed is the wrong way to put it, but more uh, harder to find. I think is uh, is we're we're we're, uh, we're trying to make sure that, that the the coffee blend is correct, uh, not 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 watered down. So, I'm um, getting the right number out. Okay, and I I can't remember, but I think it was PD who. We were doing a podcast the one day and we were remarking upon like the di- people who speak differently or similarly. And he had said I had a lilt, which was, you know, uh, similar to Midwestern uh, United States. So I guess perhaps we have a well, I guess you're not Midwest or maybe Mideast or you're Midwest. No, I'm mid- I don't know. I'm Midwest. Don't 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 tell Americans that because they will tell you otherwise. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, all that put aside the consensus thing. You're here because you cover the league. You have a wide scope. And I know for a fact that you put a ton of work into covering the league. And I also know that you watch the Raptors on occasion. So I want the people to be uh, acutely aware of what you think of them. And why not just, you know, go from Jump Street? What have you heard most often about the Raptors so far this year? What is the, what are you hearing? What is your take on the team via your uh, news feed or anything like that? Yeah. Um, I have, I mean, a couple, a couple things pop for me, like just to be transparent right away. I think I've seen probably a third of the Raptors games this year. I'd like to have seen more. I've really enjoyed watching them. I unfortunately cannot watch every single game out there as much as I'd like to try. Um, I think it's kind of been like a season of segments for me in some ways in, in how I've consumed the Raptors or at least how things have popped off. You know, like obviously they have the six and three start. A lot of it is, um scotty barnes excitement which warranted and it feels like that's cooled a little bit as he's gone on part of that because other rookies are playing so well too um then you hit the segment where pascal's back and that's good for about two games and then fans seem to get kind of disappointed about that and i'm sure we'll talk about that at some point because i haven't really understood that um and then now it's just kind of been like fred has been on an absolute tear um i mean he he's had a, a hell of a season all around but especially during the the winning streak, the last couple of games, he's been incredible, obviously. I mean, even just looking at last night, we were talking about this before, God, and I didn't get to watch the game yet, but um, it's just kind of becoming commonplace for like the little mini Fred takeovers, which are very reminiscent of Kyle, like what he used to do. Like, I, I can't remember what game it was. I want to say it was either against Golden State or or Philadelphia, I think two or three years ago when they were down double digits and Kyle ended up leading them back on this massive run, I think during the 2019 or 2020 year. Um, but like, you're, you're just getting more of that stuff from Fred. So I know that that was a much longer third segment, but that's kind of been how I've, uh, how I've gotten the Raptors have come across for me this year so far. Well, with this little series of podcasts I'm doing, I'm trying not to talk that much. I just want people to get the, the outside information basically on it. 
And Jackson was not super interested in discussing Pascal. So if you'll take it there, I mean, I, oh, I'll I'm right there. there with you, brother. Uh, let's start there then. Pascal Siakam, thoughts on what you've seen written about, what you've seen as far as watching the games yourself and kind of the the overall perception of him. Uh, I've like, I think, I've, I've, I mean, I've talked to you about this privately before too. Like, I just don't understand some of the... Uh, um, some of the confusion with Pascal, maybe that's the right way to put it. Like he's, he hasn't ever really been quite the same shooter as he was, I think what, three years ago, uh, mm-hmm. two years ago, wherever we want to go back to, um, but he's still really good. Like the passing is just as good as it was last year um, off of his drive game. Like even just looking in recent, recent weeks, he's been on a heater. Um, his own face up game has been really good. Getting into the post has looked as crisp as it ever has for him. I think the defense has come back along. And I think part of what's been frustrating, like the way people have talked about his defense, that's something you and I have definitely talked about. Um, Like he just has never gotten his legs under him. He started off with out getting to play in preseason, didn't get to participate in camp. Um, I believe it was the labor, if I remember correctly, that had him out for Mm -hmm. almost the entire first month. So of course he comes back and he's not fully there rotationally. The defense was never really there to start the year. If we're being completely honest, like the team just kind of started off in a different way. Um, And I think that definitely contributed to it, but there was just a lot of stuff that came through. Like, I mean, there was a lot of painting Pascal as the reason why the defense was bad. And then sure. He had some bad rotations here and there, but largely he's been very good defensively this year in my viewings. Um, and a lot of it's just been the rest of the team and, and part of the system too. And uh, I mean, that's a whole other thing to talk about, but I mean, Pascal's just been really good. I think Fred has clearly cemented himself as the best player on the team, but I mean, Pascal has not taken a step back in my opinion. If anything, he's been just as, just as good as he was last year. It, should, it just seems like some people are maybe taking that for granted. I think would be how I look at it. It's uh, I thought it was very interesting. The, yeah, the perception of it that he cratered the defense and if you weren't watching the games and if you were going to try and parse out meaning from just a guy joins a lineup and something happens, which is a pretty shallow way to view, <laughs> view the sport. But if you're looking, you say, well, they were six and three. Pascal comes back. Now the defense is bad. This is a Raptors team that has been underperforming its defensive talent for, you know, basically like a, a season and a half now. They have a lot of good defenders on the roster. And for some reason, they cannot punch up into even the top half of the league. And I think that's a maybe Nick Nurse hubris of his scheme, hubris of his own ability to implement stuff because it is a tough scheme to pull off and Marcus all isn't walking through that door and they don't have the, they don't have the means to have like incredible rim deterrence. There are games where Pascal and Scotty are phenomenal as the low man. And especially Scotty, that's, a burgeoning part of his game. I think that's really cool that his court coverage, especially along the baseline is coming along that way, but the Raptors, the scheme is really tough to pull off. It's most of their players are in the top 10 in miles traveled per game. That speaks to effort that's being put in. Even if it's not perfection, you're getting effort, which is what most coaches ask for. And effort isn't, you know, translating into anything meaningful defensively. Of course, it's been a little bit better lately, but it's just overall in the year, it's something that's kind of funny. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the defense overall? You, you seemed yeah. like, hell yeah, hubris. I do, I do. So I am not in the uh, the like the ho-hum camp of like, oh, the, the Raptors have to get a center. Um, I do think that they should, like if we're being completely honest, like we don't have to make this about trades or anything, but like I would like to see them get somebody who like, obviously I like Ken Birch a lot. Obviously he's more of a, a backup. I think we've seen that it's been pretty clear in watching the last two years. And that's not meant as a detriment to him, but just, you know, he's, he's not quite good enough of an offensive center to, to really be a full starter. So like, I think I look at it, I want somebody who can play like 20 to 25 minutes a game and be a starter, or at least give you that look, because like you mentioned about the miles travel, it's not even necessarily just that, like it's very reminiscent of watching the Pacers last year. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of that. I mean, Nate Bjorkman was the coach. He's back in, in Toronto and, they run a lot of things similarly. Um, it's less about miles traveled and more about how difficult it is to do that continuously. Like, I think so much gets brought up on how, oh, you know, it's just not execution. It's not this, it's not that. I'm like, well, it's really hard to just sprint corner to corner, um, 
50 times a game. Like there, it, it sounds rudimentary when you look at it possession by possession, but when you're, you know, bringing that into an entire game or, you know, a, a week where you're playing four and six nights or something like that, like it adds up and it's not easy stuff to do. And you just ask so much out of your system to, to force everybody to play that hard. And I think on one hand, yes, that can be part of what you do and part of what makes you a, a special team. And I think we've seen for Spurs, like that's what has made the Raptors a special team. But I think having a more reliable base that doesn't require as much of their guys as they ask out of them right now would do some really good for them. Like I tweeted this the other day. I just wish that they could rein it in 10% of the time, like 10 and 20% of the time, because I, I just, there's so much chaos in what they do. And part of that is their brand, but also if your entire brand is chaos, it's going to eat you at, at, at points. And I really think that it has uh, kind of cannibalized the defense at times. Cause even if they, you know, even if you have these screaming closeouts from somebody who's six foot nine with a seven, three, seven, four wingspan, like, okay, you're asking that guys to keep doing that over and over and over again. And it's, I don't know. Sometimes it just helps if you have somebody who can buffer at the back line and make it so you don't have to move 75 miles in one possession. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's well, the, the most intriguing thing, right? Is that it was more effective earlier on in the NBA's revolution because the, the NBA has been changing rapidly, the defense and the offense. And this type of scheme I think would be more successful if it's Shane Battier or three and D players of his ilk are the guys who are getting the shots, but against those really hard contests and closeouts where, you know, one of Chris Boucher, Scotty Barnes, or even Pascal Siakam are jumping out at you. Three and D players are not stapled to the spot in the corner anymore. Like they'll use an escape dribble, collect six feet from the spot and hit a jumper from there. They, they move now like that. That's a way bigger part of three and D shooters is being able to move off of the spot where they catch. And my God, the Raptors, they move guys off their spot and they give the exact same quality of shot to that guy or he goes downhill. And I understand the, the idea of like, we're going to make role players make more decisions, take higher usage. And that's how we're going to beat teams is the stars aren't going to be able to beat us. And there was some wisdom in that, I think, when role players don't have access to easier passes, when you didn't have to pinch in on drives because one of Marcus Saul was, well, basically Marcus Saul or Serge Ibaka was back there to deter shots at the rim or in the really short floater range, which is, that's where the role players really had trouble. And when they have it in this scheme with this roster context, everybody has to pinch in because they don't have a traditional rim deterrent. And that's why Precious Achua, despite his horrible, like really horrible offensive prowess so far, has been one of the most important defenders this year. And that's reflected by eye test and by the catch-all metrics. So I think, yeah, I think a center would be like immensely helpful for what they're trying to do if they still want to, to do it, you know? Yeah, and I think that's part of what's so uh, confusing about this season. Um, like... I mean, this season was kind of the same reset. It's maybe the wrong way to put it. It's not like the roster. I mean, the roster changed a little bit, but not a ton. Um, but, like, we don't really know what Toronto is headed towards. And I think there's something endearing about that. Like, okay, we're, we're seeing things, you know, figuring things out. Like, um, like with Scotty, I think I had an idea of who he was going to be coming into the NBA, and I felt really good about it, and he's blown that out of the water. And as, you know, I thought my comp for him coming in was, like, a little bit – uh, Thad Young with more juice, and now he's got more in common with Ferdinand Magellan ex exploring the world than, than Thad Young exploring the court. So it's like, um, it, it's hard to pin down where I'm at with this team or, or where this team's at with this team, frankly. I think it would be worthwhile for us to come together at the end of the season uh, and review the defense with with like a, a longer run time, honestly, where we can mm -hmm. really dig into it. We'll take a couple days. We'll do the deep dive on the numbers, some film, and we'll revisit this because there's uh, there's some good stuff here. But at 19 and 17, do you think the Raptors record is an accurate reflection of the skill on the roster? Because they, they are one of the higher ranking teams as far as luck adjustment. And by that, I mean, they rank as luckier. Now, you don't have to buy into those metrics. I'm just trying to paint the picture of like, hey, is their record an accurate reflection of the skill? Um, I think it's pretty close, like even just going down, like 
uh, OG has missed a third of the season. And I think mm -hmm. that heavily factors into, um, you know, some of the games that they've lost. Um, they've, I think they're, I don't have the numbers like directly in front of me because A, they're hard to find, but B, like, I don't know exactly how many COVID games have been missed um, for the roster. I know Toronto is like somewhere around the middle of the pack, if I remember correctly, but um, like, I don't, I mean, Fred has still played almost the entire year. Scotty hasn't missed much of the year. Um, I do think this is around where I would, um, in terms of just like actual on court talent, you know, seeing how Scotty has played, seeing how the, the newer guys have played and how things have evolved. I think this is around where I would picture them. Yeah. They, they are better than I had expected coming into the year, but given what I've seen of all the players, this feels pretty correct. Like I was absolutely mm -hmm. gobsmacked when they were six and three. That I am right there away. with you. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and I thought the six and three start was largely because of their very aggressive scheme where they aren't standing in the spot where the, the rim can, the, like there's nobody there when the rim contests are coming, they're rotating over hard. And the, the lighter whistle definitely helped them during the start of the year. Like they were a monstrous defensive team and the offensive rebounding. And now the half court has really been not solved all the way, but is in a much, much better place since Pascal came back. And the defense has leveled out a bit too. And especially with Scotty Barnes and Gary Trent giving you so much more, you know, and a mix of both sides on the court than anybody probably expected. That's uh, they look like a team that should be roughly around 500 or above it. So yeah, that, that makes sense for me. Do you think they could catch the Cavs? Oh, that is tough. Um, I think I haven't got to watch last night's Cavs game yet, but I've seen most of their games this year. Um, it's just really hard to know how things are going to fall out with them with Ricky Rubio out. Like I, I legitimately think um, like to, to most people, I think they would, if you've only seen three or four Cavs games this year, you would have seen Ricky Rubio go out and be like, yeah, oh, well, that stinks. You know, maybe they'll be fine. Um, I really think that's going to hurt them. Like, I know that they went and got John Rondo, and I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm higher on that than other people. I just think it's 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 for John Rondo. It's a vet minimum contract. Ooh, whatever. Like, I don't, I don't think it's anything that requires a ton of buzz. Like, that's somebody who can play basketball for 10 or 15 minutes a game. It's not completely replacing Ricky, but it's something. Um, I think if Toronto doesn't deal with any significant injuries, they could definitely catch Cleveland because um, I do have questions about what their offense is going to look like without Ricky. Hmm. Interesting. Actually, I want to, before we do the Fred Van Vliet all-star thing, I you are somebody who has a reputation for wanting to dig in and champion the end of bench players. Yeah. the 17th man that doesn't exist yet right you're 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 saying this guy should be on an nba roster so are are there guys that you're really cheering for in the vicinity of the raptors whether it's the 905 or whether it's at the end of the bench uh i really like david johnson um i was really high on him coming into the draft uh, i still like i loved that he he came into toronto you and hank um, yeah, no, yes, me and Hank. I have I have not gotten to watch anything of 905, but I would like to see things pop for him. Um, I still have a lot of Malachi Flintstock. I really do hate how Nick Nurse uses him. Uh, I just, like, it's very similar to DeLon Wright with me, with Malachi Flynn. Like, if you're not going to run the offense through him, then don't even put him on the court. I Like, yes, he can, he can catch and shoot, but this guy is really good at operating in the half court as a backup point guard. Just let him play backup point guard instead of trying to... It, it's a whole thing, but yeah, I, 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 I see that with Malachi, uh, Justin Champagne has been awesome this year. Like I've been pretty surprised by him. He's more athletic than he was at, at Pitt last year. Hell yeah. Um, especially defensively. Like I had real questions about him defensively and if you'd be able to hold laterally and he's been awesome with rim contest too, as somebody who's like six, six and just kind of does a little bit of everything. Like he's been a perfect Raptor pretty much. Um, I wish Isak Bongo was healthy. Uh, and just like actually getting more runtime. Uh, the last shot I'll give DJ Wilson, I really hope sticks because he's good. Like the one game he started, um, I think he showcased why he should be a player in the NBA. Like he's really improved defensively from where he was at with the, with the Bucks. Um, basically, I love every player who plays on the Raptors. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I mean, that's what I like. I, I won't even mention Delano because he's been a part of the rotation all year and really good. So it's just it's, calling him fringe would be unfair. But 
um, yeah, I really like a lot of, of what the Raptors have going on developmentally towards the end of the bench. We will squeeze champagne conversation into the next podcast we do because I am champagne pilled. I, he's, he's a savant. He, the reads he makes as a cutter and as a rebounder, th- that's the thing about like scouting, right? Is can you extrapolate that feel, that read for the floor into other aspects of the game? Do you think that they'll be able to have outlier development in other areas because they very clearly have something that generates their ability to be in the right place at the right time? And Champagne has that in spades. Like he is always in the right place. And his hands, man, he's one of the best left-handed finishers I've seen as far as a, as far as especially a wing player. Like he uses the left when he doesn't need to use the left. Like it's like LeBron-esque almost. And so yeah, he he's such a quality player. The three-point shot isn't there yet. If it and you know, the Raptors are famous for training guys to have a three-point set shot from the corner. Now he'll probably need more than that as the you know the NBA changes and grows and different things are asked. But even if he just added that to his game with you know how uh, conscientious he is of the floor, especially as a rebounder and cutter, that I think that would be awesome. So we'll definitely make some time for that. With Malachi, I this is something I've talked about a bunch too, is I agree with you that his job is incredibly hard every time he steps on the court. Like, like it is a very, very difficult thing to walk onto the court, have everybody look at you and say, you have no pick and roll partners who have roll gravity. Get in there, take a screen, create an advantage or shimmy and make a bucket. And for a guy who doesn't have undeniable shot making craft, that is like a tight wire act every single stint that you step on the court. And that's where he's at. So I have to ask you, with Malachi Flynn, is there somebody you'd like to see the Raptors bring into the second unit? Or is there another team that you think Malachi Flynn would pair well with one of their bench bigs to kind of revive his career? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, wow. You know, I really wish that the, the Raptors would just have a bench big, like you're mentioning, like even – um, even if you had Surge, like I, I know it's not the same. Like Surge has not been great this year, but like somebody who can pick and pop or somebody who can mm-hmm. who can roll and, and make some short roll reads, even if like the accuracy on the pass can be terrible, if they can at least get it going somewhere, that's a that's a plus. But um I don't know. Like I think it's less about that, just because the Raptors seem pretty hell bent on not being that team. Um, I would rather just see him get traded, you know, if we're being honest. Um, like imagine Malachi playing in Phoenix. Like, I know they don't need him in Phoenix, uh, but like him operating with DeAndre Ayton and JaVale McGee, like that would be fantastic for him. Or even in, in like Memphis, like let's say that he gets to work with Steven Adams or, um, which is not like a great comparison, but there are a lot of places where I think he could really thrive, but it's just, it's, you know, it takes buy-in from, I think like Malachi for me was, um, not that I was like heavy in his draft or anything, but he's somebody who, um, is really important for me in understanding and and uh, trying to get a better feel of how a team wants to use a guy. Because if if they view this player as like a guy who's going to be able to create his own shot in the half court without screens or, or do this or do that, and um, you know very clearly like, okay, that's – well, he can't do that. So it's – it definitely changes up how you how you view what a guy is capable of doing in a given role or um, what their uh, forecast could look like in a different situation. But also it brings into the, as you mentioned, Delano like has been a part of the rotation for a large part of the year. He hasn't been the past few games, but, you know, they're regulating. They, they have their big wing trio, wing slash big trio, I guess, let's say, for the first time. So Delano is, you know, kind of mixing in different looks and, they, they've been get going Scotty with bench more often. So Delano is maybe a bit redundant, but uh, the Delano slash Malachi conversation really allows you to say, wow, team context is incredibly important. Yeah. Because Delano Banton hasn't been able, to, I think you could count on two hands, the amount of plays he's created from the screen and roll this year. Everything else has been push the ball and vibes. And he deserves love for being able to do that. He's hit more shots than I think he would have this year. And his touch at the rim is good. So hell yeah, Delano. But the Raptors team, their play style, the context of it is so friendly to him and so alienating to Malachi. And that I think creates like the exact prism to look through to say, 
holy smokes, it's hard to make it in the NBA. And so much is out yeah. of your control. Yeah, no, 100%, man. Yeah. Okay. Fred Van Vliet, the all-star question mark, Mark Schindler? Uh, the all-star for sure. Um, I don't I don't think there should be a question. Um, like, I don't know. Our uh, our good friend Mike De La Rosa has, has, is definitely high on Darius Garland, and I am there with him. I, I agree Darius Garland's been awesome, and I, I don't like pitting the guys against one another. Um, but I think you saw a lot of interesting feedback and, and takes off that. Like, I think in some ways we've almost undersold how good Fred has been defensively. Like, I mean, Fred would probably, I mean, he would definitely be all defense for me. I think he would be first team guard for me. Um, he's been better than Marcus Smart. He's been better than like a lot of the typical um, guys that we get pulled for that. Like, I think he's had a better defensive season than Drew Holiday, for being honest. Um, and that's without like mentioning that he's somebody who should get most improved votes. Like he won't because of statistical production, but I mean, he's gone from one of the worst at room finishers in the NBA to still not great, but slightly better. He's picking his spots better. He's finishing better ways to finding better ways to finish through contact. And more importantly, he went from just a non-factor as a mid-range shooter to one of the best in the NBA now, just kind of out of nowhere, which is incredible based on top of what he's already doing as a shooter from deep. Um, his passing's been better, like just his pacing and patience overall in the half court are so much improved from where he's been in prior years. And, um, you know, he's gone from being somebody who was a lot more of a, um, I don't want to call him a combo guard, but he was more of just like a Blake break, break glass in case of emergency point guard. And now like, you're like, okay, he's actually a starting, like a viable starting point guard who can create in, in the half court. Um, that feels more like a pitch for most improved, but I think it's more like this guy is really damn good. He's the best player on the Toronto Raptors. I don't see how you can find 11 players who should be in over him. Uh, if we're being completely honest when looking at, at, at the all-star game. I like that you bring up, you know, his, his development as a point guard, because for a long time he was, and you know, it, it really, with the context of him shooting, over 50% on catch and shoot triples this year, like, which is absurd. And he's making over two a game that that is just free points, basically that the, the Raptors roster is getting, but uh, he was like Clay Thompson who had been hit over the head with like a bugs bunny mallet, just shorter Clay Thompson for a while. And he was always dynamite catching and shooting. He could trail guys around screens, run through mazes, and he was hellish on ball. And then for that guy, around 25 years old at that point, to start developing reps as an on-ball guy to the point now where he's he's not one of the best pick-and-roll manipulators, but especially with his higher usage as a pull-up guy this year, has been able to manipulate defenses into higher hedges, into a higher level at the screen to defend. And despite having basically no dominant role threats, Ananobi is probably like OG is probably the Raptors best role threat on this team, which is absurd and speaks to, you know, how good Ananobi is for a wing and how, you know, below average cam precious and Boucher is nice, but he's not a starter or anything that he's been able to, you know, lead these guys into some buckets and he's passing for more layups this year than he ever has before. It's, it's an incredible develop for him. And also like you mentioned, Mike, basically for people who don't know, um, there was a tweet that, you know, drew the ire of Raptors Twitter. A lot of vitriol, yes. Um, Mike, my kid basically, to sum up what he said is he's saying Darius Garland creates incredible reads out of the pick and roll. And that is so dependable and so great that I like to bet on that as more valuable than what Fred Van Vliet is doing. And do I think that maybe undersells Fred Van Vliet a little bit? Maybe. And like but it's always good to be high on players. And Darius Garland will be maybe even an all NBA player at some point during his career. He's super exciting. So I don't, I don't begrudge Mike saying that at all. I totally get what he's saying, but I, I am of the mind that like, yeah, Fred is an all-star man. I'm, I'm glad you agree. Yeah, no, he's, he's been special this year, man. And it's just, uh, especially going back and thinking about where he was a couple of years ago to compare it to now is just kind of insane. Like I remember watching him play at Wichita state. I think it was, uh, gosh, um, they played, I want to say that they played the Kentucky team that had Julius Randall on it. Um, 
when he was there and they ended up losing in the elite eight. And I just like, even like going back and thinking about that version of Fred Van Vliet compared to where he's at now is uh, one of the more ridiculous uh, development trajectories that, that we've just kind of ever really seen uh, in basketball, if we're being honest. Mm-hmm. Whether it's Clee Anthony early or Pascal Siakam, <laughs> Fred plays second fiddle to a big wing that he will eventually surpass. And I do. And I had a I, lot of Clee Anthony early stock. If we're being honest, just based on his name alone. His name was <laughs> awesome, man. Oh, I it's, used a, to, it's a uh, great name. He was the guy that I always would just like bump all of his ratings in two K and turn him into a random like off the dribble wing initiator. But yeah, you know, who who's your ultimate two K um, bump up ratings guy? Oh. Man, that's a great question. I would always make it so Thad Young could dribble. Um, <laughs> Thad has never really been able to dribble throughout his career. Um, that was the only thing holding him back from being a Hall of Famer as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, yeah, no, Thad was always up there. Um, I used to make Roy Hibbert fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in case you were looking for, you know, turning turning Roy Hibbert into DeAndre Jordan athleticism, Roy Hibbert was always a blast. Um, those are around there. I, I normally like try to keep the ratings the same though, because I liked I like playing things dead on and just having fun with it. Mark, I gotta say that kicks ass, dude. Everybody just bumps up the three point sliders on their favorite player, and you're like, what if Roy Hibbert, the king of the rule of verticality, was like the flash out on the court? That is that is some huge galaxy brain two K playing there. I, uh, I get a little too excited sometimes doing uh, historical theoreticals. Yeah. And Thadjik Johnson, of course. Oh, uh, the dude, dribbling uh, version. He's so good. Uh, I, it was actually really funny because not, not to extend this too long, but I remember when I unveiled my, my comp for Scotty as Thad Young, people were like disappointed. I was like, dude, that is like one of the best <laughs> players of the last 10 years. Like it's not going to, in terms of just like actual like raw statistical production, sure, maybe not, but um, like, I don't think anybody's been more adaptable as a player throughout their career. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's clearly he's like I said, he's blowing that out of the water already, but yeah, that put some respect on Thad's name. He was awesome, man. Just go back and watch the 15, 16 nets, the primary initiator, Thad Young. He actually had, uh, he had a game, multiple games, actually, if you just go back through NBA.com shot charts where he only took shots on the left side of the court because he's like strictly left-hand dominant, which like totally throws people off. Cause he's just got to, he like will oddly release hook shots before he's even off the ground, but still goes through a shooting motion. Like he's just, he's a very funky player to watch uh, play and super cool dude too. So always, uh, always on my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's where, if people say, how could you say that Scotty is Thad Young? You say, you have no idea what Thad Young means to me. This is the highest compliment <laughs> exactly. I could possibly give. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any parting shots? Because there was a question. Well, actually, we'll do this. Is there a player on the Raptors? If you were a contender, who are you trying to pry away? And like, obviously, teams want stars if they can get them. But as we know, you like to, you know, dig around the end of benches and stuff like that and look for meaning in those players who deserve the meaning, of course. So let's have some end of bench guys or end of rotation guys. Oh, that's a good question. Um. Man, I kind of, this is tough. Um, I mean, like Gary is obviously a, ascended past that. Um, we didn't even talk about Gary Trent at all. Like I've been so impressed with him this year and his, his growth as a player all around. Um, he's somebody like, I think that's the kind of guy you definitely want to try and pry away, but I don't see why the Raptors should trade him. Um, I mean, probably Malachi for me. Like, he's a very clear second draft guy to me. Like, if if a team was high on him early on, um, like in, in the if a team was high on him in the draft process, and and they still have the same front office and coaching staff in place, like, I would definitely go out of my way to try and get Malachi Flynn and say, hey, look, we have a backup point guard who's going to be really good. Um, backup point guards underrated, man. Like, I hate saying over and underrated, but it's just true. Like, being a backup point guard is that is good is hard to find um, because most of the time, if you're good enough to be a backup point guard, who's good, you're good enough to be a starter. So somebody's going to start you. Um, last shot I would have to Yuta. Yuta's awesome. Like mm-hmm. 
everybody needs a player who's six foot seven slash six foot eight with great vibes who can shoot threes and pass the ball. So uh, imagine disliking you to water. I mean, I can't surely. That was uh that was Jackson's choice. He said, Utah was going to be the guy. If a team was looking for a wing who could be like the eighth, ninth man and they're a contender, Utah mm-hmm. slots in there beautifully. I was going to say part of my, I think uh, is another very random parting shot, but um, one of my favorite games that I watched uh, this, I guess, off season, um, I was doing something on like a deep dive on Rui Hachimura and I was just watching him and, and Yuta play as like the one and two on Japan's national team is like, uh, I think I watched four or five of their games. Very, very fun. If you, if you want something to do on a random Saturday. Hachimura is the prince that was promised. Still believe in him. I think he's going to turn it around. Uh, I yeah, I, I do like the comment about, well, you, you can always say underrated. Everybody loves to be told that they're underrated. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's never bad to use that. But your point about like, you know, backup point guards being underrated. The best teams have good backup point guards and good backup bigs. Uh, I know we've been obsessed with wings for a long time, but you look at championship rosters. They always have like an ironclad guard and they always have that, you know, diamond in the rough big who can come off the bench. It is it's impossible to win without those guys. So if you don't have them on your roster, you have to try and get them. Exactly. All right, Mark, thank you for being so generous with your time, letting the fine people of Toronto and the people who aren't of Toronto, but are fans of the team, or, you know, perhaps people who just listen to this podcast for any other number of reasons. Thanks for letting them know how you feel about them. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. This was a blast. Anything you'd like to plug? before you get out of here books yourself a good tv show no food um yeah so i just wrote something over at basketball news about josh hart um for the new orleans pelicans they are oddly oh, enough yeah, 13 and 13 and 13 since november 13th uh, i love numbers like that um but no he's just been really good man like josh hart's gone from somebody who was kind of like the um the exact like litmus test for what a three and D player is like, he wasn't a great shooter, but he was like a good enough shooter on stationary stuff. He could attack closeouts and he could pass connectively and play defense. And now he can dribble and he's kind of figuring out how to do pick and rolls. And um, just like, I, I really enjoy watching guys learn how to do new things. So he's been fun. Um, as far as TV shows, I watched Lupin in uh, in its entirety. It's a French TV show. Mm-hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, the the lead character is played by Omar Sy, who is um, has a part in Jurassic World. Uh, that's that's all I know from 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 American cinema. But really good, man! Like one of the best TV shows I've ever watched. Um, and I'm planning on starting Secession sometime soon. But yeah, um, that that is it. Lupin is yeah. I, I watched that as soon as it came out. I watched it. It was it was so good. And yeah, for anybody who's looking for any Josh Hart reading. Josh Hart is maybe the most Raptors slash Kyle Lowry player who has never been near the vicinity of the Raptors or Kyle Lowry. And Mark's piece on him was great. And if I can just give you the last blurb of it before uh, we get out of here, quote, next time you're flipping through league pass and have an opportunity to catch the Pelicans, tune in. Everybody could use a little more of Josh Hart's funk in their daily life, end quote. And, you know, that sign off is absolutely correct. We could all use a little bit more Josh Hart. Mark? Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks for having me on, man. All right. And listener, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. The next episode, I believe, is with Nakias Duncan, who is also of Basketball News and, uh, you know, a colleague of Mark's and a great person covering the league, doing a great job of doing so. So I'm excited for his insights and very excited to have had Mark's. Thanks for tuning in, whether you got into it in the morning or at night. Have a blessed day and goodbye.